folks who are just joining, uh, if you can take a, a, just a second to, if possible, rename yourself to let us know um, who you are and where you're from. Uh, you can just take a moment to rename yourself and if interested uh, or possible, if you can turn on your video as well, that's awesome. Okay, and as a reminder, this is um, our approval statement for our conference for our medical track. So this nursing continuing professional development activity was approved by the Ohio Nurses Association. Um, for those who were with me this morning, you had the opportunity to listen to me read it again, but just so you all have the heads up that this is uh, an approved session. Uh, and it is based with your participation and completion of your evaluation form, which will be made available um, at the end of the session. Um, so to earn your hours, of course, you need to fill out your evaluation. There is the website link is on here, but I will also add it to the chat at the end of the session. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to Mary Ellen. So I'll leave that up for you. Awesome. Well, um, hello, everyone. My name is Lauren. Uh, we want to stay on time today and get started right at three. Um, so I'm going to go ahead uh, and introduce to you um, Emma, who is uh, joining us from Alberta, Canada today, which is very exciting. Uh, Emma McLaughlin is a Master's of Science student in the Health and Wellness Lab at the University of Calgary. She is training under the supervision of Dr. Nicole Kulos reed and the mentorship of Dr. Amanda Wirtz. She, is a bachelor, she has a Bachelor of Kinesiology with honors from Acadia University. Her research is focused on developing resources to support movement among children and adolescents affected by cancer. Internationally, Emma is a research assistant on the International Pediatric Oncology Exercise Guidelines, uh, which you're going to hear about today, um, which is being led by Dr. Kulos Reed and Wurz. So welcome, uh, Emma. We are so excited to have you. Um, and we will uh, throw it over to you. If anyone has questions throughout the presentation, feel free free to put them in the chat. If not, we'll have some time at the end. Um, great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Lauren, for the introduction and for Matt getting us going with some awesome tunes. Um, I take it everybody is able to see my screen here, the classic, classic question once we get going online. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, hello everyone. I just wanna take the time to thank you all for having me as a member of your virtual conference today. As Lauren mentioned, my name is Emma McLaughlin. I am a master's student and fitness instructor here at the University of Calgary um, in the Health and Wellness Lab. I shouldn't say here, currently I am at home as I'm sure most of you are as well. And as indicated on my slides here, I will be speaking to you today about the International Pediatric Oncology Exercise Guidelines. That was a great job, Lauren, that was a mouthful. Um, and how these guidelines represent the first steps towards promoting movement for children and adolescents affected by cancer. And I do wanna acknowledge that I will be speaking today as a student who has been involved in the project on behalf of Dr. Wurz and Dr. Nicole Colos reed Where's my slide? Here. Okay, and so to briefly tell you a bit more about the leads of this project, Dr. Amanda Wurz is a postdoctoral scholar in the Health and Wellness Lab at the University of Calgary, and her research is focused on developing and testing physical activity interventions to promote health and quality of life for young people affected by cancer. And Dr. Nicole Kulos, Kulos Reed is the professor and director of the Health and Wellness Lab in the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary. And she is a behavior change researcher with expertise in pragmatic pro program delivery to enhance wellness in cancer survivorship. And so Nicole's area of research is working with children, adolescents um, up into the adulthood as well. And so before I dive into the content, I first want to let you know what you might be able to expect with leaving today. I want you to walk away from your computer. I know it's yet another virtual call and meeting that we're on today, but my hope is that you will leave with a greater understanding of the benefits of physical activity, which you may see on my slides as PA for children and adolescents affected by cancer, 
an understanding of the International Pediatric Oncology Exercise Guidelines, what these statements are, and the scope of implementation for physical activity and supportive resources for this cohort. So to get started, as I'm sure you know with the expertise in your camps, pediatric cancer refers to cancer that is diagnosed in a child or adolescent, typically before the age of 19 years. And this group is considered to be a small and distinct population because a diagnosis of cancer in this age range is quite rare. And this group has a unique cancer experience. It is the leading cause of disease and death. And as you likely can imagine, maybe through your own experiences working in camps or stories you've heard, being diagnosed with a chronic disease, undergoing intense and long-term treatment regimens, and being confronted with mortality during a time when you are learning how to engage with the world, beginning to define yourself and establish peer relationships can have huge negative implications. And because of this, we know that children and adolescents affected by cancer experience high symptom burden that includes things like decreased physical functioning and fitness, metabolic syndromes, osteoporosis, cardiac dysfunction, fatigue and or anxiety, and lowered self-esteem and quality of life. And these are just a few that I'll mention here. And so researchers like myself, like Dr. Wurz and Dr. Coolis reed have concerned themselves with identifying interventions or strategies to enhance health and quality of life or to counteract this burden. And one strategy that has been found to address or improve many of the negative effects of cancer and its treatments is physical activity. We and others have found that physical activity can positively impact outcomes across physical, psychological, social, and cognitive domains of functioning. And evidence is reported in both descriptive and experimental research studies and has been summarized in systematic reviews. And so those might be some crazy, some scary words, but I'll kind of walk you through the evidence that exists to date. So descriptive studies are those that involve observation. So looking at individuals, observing them in a research study and what they're doing. And this type of evidence suggests that physical activity is associated with increased quality of life, physical fitness, cardiopulmonary functioning, and cardiovascular profiles. We also see that there's decreased psychological morbidity, cognitive impairment, risk of cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality. So that's our descriptive evidence. When looking to experimental evidence or experimental studies, um, this is research that involves interventions that are carefully controlled by the research team. So there's aspects of that um, intervention that would be carefully controlled by myself or someone else. And that could be things such as the physical activity treatment or physical activity intervention that someone is given or not given. And so physical activity interventions in experimental evidence have been found to be safe and feasible um, and in a recent review that we conducted in our lab, only one study identified an adverse event in which a participant suffered an injury, they received immediate medical attention, they were covered and were re-able to join the physical activity program. And so we see that physical activity within experimental evidence context helps to increase physical activity levels and decrease their sedentary or sitting time and improve physical and psychological and social outcomes. So in terms of review evidence, a review is the highest level of quality of evidence that we have, and reviews work to summarize in existing evidence from a different variety of literature. So we take the body of literature that exists on a certain topic and bring it together to summarize. And there are several reviews published in this field of pediatric exercise oncology. And in our lab, we recently just completed a comprehensive review and found similar to what I already said that physical activity is safe and feasible for children and adolescents affected by cancer. And beyond these findings, we also identified five main outcomes. You can see them here as those little pictures on your screen, but we found physical activity behavior outcomes, physical, psychosocial, cognitive, and other outcomes. And these other outcomes included things such as dietary or energy intake or length of hospitalization. And so in general, across these outcomes, we found improvements or no change 
which suggests to us that physical activity is beneficial and other factors such as treatment status may impact some of the findings. So for example, when we look to children and adolescents on treatment, we see that physical activity can lessen symptoms and side effects, can help to promote bone mineral density and muscle strength, and overall can positively affect immune function. In this way, we would not expect to see improvements in outcomes during treatment, but rather a mitigation of decline. So we can think of coming here, a child or adolescent coming in with treatment, and when we're bringing in physical activity, if we're looking at that immune function with our treatment, we can already begin to expect that decline, but physical activity can help to keep us on par of where that child or adolescent already came in um, prior to treatment. So we would see keeping at that um, same level there. Conversely, when we're talking about after treatment, physical activity can improve cognitive functioning, alleviate symptoms of cardiac toxicity, improve bone mineral density, promote fitness, the list goes on and on of the positive benefits after treatment. So we can see that after treatment, we can expect to see some of these greater improvements that we might not necessarily see on treatment. So we know that physical activity is good. So why is this population largely inactive? What are the barriers preventing children and adolescents from engaging in physical activity? And as I ask you these questions, maybe some barriers are already coming to mind that you're thinking of in how you, the children and adolescents who come to your camp or access your services might already be facing barriers that are preventing them from being active. And so maybe you've started to think about these barriers, but these barriers might include any of the six areas that I am gonna walk through here or beyond. And so we see that there are physical barriers things such as treatment related side effects. We have psychological barriers. So the lack of self-confidence for an individual to feel that they are capable to be physically active. Social barriers such as the lack of social support from friends or family to be physically active. Cognitive impairments such as developmental delays. Personal barriers such as preferences and physical activity. And I'll talk a little bit about this later, but this is a key piece of understanding what is an individual's motivation to be physically active? What do they like to do that's physically active? And the environment, so things such as parental factors or the financial resources impacting them from being physically active. And so these examples here are the ones that have already come to mind are barriers, meaning they're in things that are making it harder for children and adolescents affected by cancer to be physically active. And so these are just some of the barriers that might limit this population from being physically active. But beyond these barriers, there is a large gap between what we know in research and what is being done in practice. In fact, until recently, a big barrier to physical activity in this cohort was the lack of physical activity guidelines or information describing how to do physical activity or how much physical activity to do. So in order to help address this gap, we created the International Pediatric Oncology Exercise Guidelines. That's the International Pediatric Oncology Exercise Guidelines. I will be referring to those as IPOEG throughout. Um, and over the next few slides, I will walk you through the process that we took to create the IPOEG, which are guideline and recommendation statements around physical activity. So in our preparation phase, which took place from September 20 of 18 to September 2019, we started with an international team of nine experts from six countries. And from there, we identified over 120 international experts from 22 countries working in the field of pediatric exercise oncology. So this included individuals such as healthcare providers, qualified exercise professionals, allied healthcare providers. And those are just a few of the designations of the individuals who represent our network. And so I know this slide looks very busy. <laughs> it's not to intimidate you at all, but it's just to highlight the spread of the involvement that we had to help create the IPOEG. From there, we gathered data from our network of the individuals. So those 120 international experts from the 22 countries from February of 2019 to August of 2019. In this phase, in the data gathering phase, we conducted three online surveys 
And surveys were given to those international experts. And we asked a broad range of questions initially. And as we move through the surveys, the questions did get more specific over time. And the questions we asked were to gain consensus or to gain an agreement on the definitions, the content, and the type of evidence that should be and that should inform the IPOIC. At the same time that we did this, we also conducted a literature synthesis. This was that review I mentioned a bit earlier on. And with that review, we identified 69 experimental articles and over 20 reviews to understand the benefits and the state of literature in this area. In September of 2019, we then held an expert meeting with our core team of nine international experts. We also had two local healthcare providers. So again, I am speaking to you today from Calgary, Alberta. So we had two local Calgary healthcare providers and eight trainees from within our lab. And at this meeting, we summarized and presented the findings from the three surveys that we presented, as well as the literature synthesis. And we worked as a team in iterative fashion. So a lot of conversations, little group discussions and worksheets to come to agreement on what the IPOEG should be. So that IPOE content. And as you can see by this picture here, we also enjoyed the Canadian Rockies and the opportunity to meet in person, which I think we're all realizing that we definitely took for granted. But the outputs from this meeting were that we drafted the guideline and recommendation statements, which we then returned to the larger group of international experts for, for another um, online survey. And so this online survey was distributed from October 2019 to February of 2020. Um, and we collected data and finalized the IPOI guideline and recommendation statements. So you're probably like Emma, that was long-winded. I'm here to figure out what these guideline and recommendation statements are. Well, team, we are here, we have made it. So before we truly dive in, I just want to go over two important definitions that came out of the IPOIG. The first is movement and the second is exercise. And so movement is defined as any bodily motion that requires energy expenditure. And movement can look like anything. And so I'm gonna encourage you, we're gonna take a quick little movement break. And if you're in a chair, if you're standing, we're just gonna start by having a couple shoulder rolls here. And so maybe you start to close your eyes, it feels good. If you're on your inhale, maybe the shoulders come up towards your ears. On the exhale, we roll them back down. Here we're starting to get some movement in starting to connect to our breaths. That feels good. Maybe we bring the shoulders forward. So on that inhale, we roll up, exhale, bring them down to the front. And if that's feeling good, maybe we interlace our hands in front of us. My exhale, I'm reaching up towards the sky, my biggest stretch of the day. This one always makes me yawn. So if you yawn, I won't take it personally. I inhale to reach further to the sky. And as I exhale, I reach over to the side. If that doesn't feel great on your arms up overhead, sometimes I like to reach my arms straight out in front of me. That's a great alternative as well. And inhale, coming back to center. And then next exhale, reaching to the other side. And so you coming back to that breath, that inhale, we come back to center and that exhale, we move to the other side. Do a couple more rounds of this at your own pace. Maybe from here, coming to one of my favorites, a chest opener. So I'm giving myself a nice big hug. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Arms coming back wide. And then arms coming back in for that hug again. Inhale, opening up, stretching in through that chest and then rounding through. And so that's a little, a little teaser of a movement break. We could do some sit to stands and some other things that no need to do that. But I just wanna highlight for you here that movement can look like anything. Movement can also be the activities of daily living that we do. So for me, getting up out of bed, walking to my office here today, which is around the corner, <laughs> um, walking to go get a snack after this, those are our activities of daily living. So movement is anything that we do to move our body. Whereas exercise is planned, structured and repetitive physical activity for the purpose of conditioning any part of the body to improve health and maintain fitness. And so I'm sure you might already be starting to think about how your camps are already including movement or physical activity, even if you didn't think of them in the context of these definitions before. And so our IPOE guideline statements were created to advise people on how to engage in physical activity. 
This includes things such as how often and how much. And these statements you see on the slide here, I'll walk us through. But the first one is directed to our children, adolescents affected by cancer, but to choose to move. Do what you can, do it when you can. The second is that movement is possible and important for every child and adolescent affected by cancer. This is true across all ages, abilities, diagnoses, stages, and phases. And additionally, it's important for every child and adolescent affected by cancer across all settings. So here are a few examples are in hospital, in community, at camps, at school. And movement might look and feel different every day and that's okay. So as you can see here, these guidelines are quite general. They're very general. And that's because of the state of our evidence right now. We don't have enough data to specify how many times a week we should be physically active or the intensity for this population. But we do know from the evidence that movement in general is good. So the key takeaway is the importance on increasing movement and supporting children and adolescents to move in a way that feels good for them. And so beyond these guideline um, statements, we also have some content to advise on the transition from movement to exercise. So I'll now give you some time to read through this long-winded slide here, and then I'll summarize the main findings. And so you might be wrapping up here. But what we see is that when we're transitioning from movement to exercise, or in cases where you're unsure about the safety of movement, whether it's for the individuals you are working with, you can refer, refer them to a healthcare team. And this is also where our recommendation statements come in, which is what we created to advise on how to tailor physical activity based on specific needs or circumstances. And here again, in that highlighted context, what we see is that communication with healthcare teams and qualified exercise professionals are important to promote physical activity. And beyond this, an exercise professional with specific pediatric cancer and exercise knowledge gained through specific training or clinical experience is really important to ensure the safety and effectiveness of exercise for children and adolescents affected by cancer. And the goal of this information is to clearly describe who is an exercise professional. So is someone with that specific cancer and exercise training specific to children and adolescents affected by cancer, that clinical training and knowledge. And to underscore the importance of ongoing and clear communication between all members. And so that's also including you and your roles in camps as well and making sure that you have that clear communication from those exercise professionals or healthcare teams as well. And so to help facilitate this communication and professional expertise, we created an intake to move more form, which includes the items listed here on the screen. So things such as age, diagnosis and date, understanding treatments, medical issues, symptoms and side effects that might impact physical activity or exercise, other restrictions, therapy, physician's notes, and though all of these points are important as a behavior change researcher, so me understanding how we can allow individuals to feel confident in movement and allow them to be physically active for the duration of their life, I want to place emphasis on those last two bullet points. Because working to understand a participant's preferences and barriers, so we identified some of those barriers earlier, understanding the preferences and barriers to physical activity as well as current physical activity levels is critical to tailor and promote enjoyment and effectiveness of physical activity. And so the children you may work with, you already see it, they have different things that they enjoy, whether it's physical activity related or not, different shows. And if there's ways that we can incorporate some of those fun pieces into it, it's encouraging them to be physically active in a way that means more to them. And that might be completely different for me, to Lauren, to Matt, and the rest of you here. 
And I already skipped ahead to this next slide, but here we go. If you are interested in receiving more information about the IPOEG or want to join our mailing list, giving us a brief little interlude here in the middle, um, you can scan this QR code, uh, either using a scanner app or your, uh, your camera phone. I know I'm definitely getting a lot more familiar with these QR codes now these days. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of time to do this if you want. We will have some time later on. I'll bring this back up. But this QR code will take you to a survey that will ask you some basic demographic information um, that we need in order to welcome you to our network of over 150 international experts now. We have grown that since our 120 in international experts. So if you didn't have time to grab that QR code, no worries, there's another one coming later. Um, and so the IPOIC. We do have the IPOEG and we do acknowledge that it is a first great step to help address the need for increased physical activity. But we also are aware that there are many identified gaps concerned with translating this knowledge and evidence to practice. So you can see that red line, what is the barrier? What is the barrier for us to move that evidence into practice? And so in an attempt to help bridge this gap, implementation efforts are required. So these are efforts that will allow us to help take that bridge over the big gap that we have. So now I'll spend some time discussing a bit of the scope of what is already being done in this space, in addition to the incredible movement opportunities that you're already offering in your camps. And so I do not wanna take away from the incredible work that you are already doing, but just highlighting some additional resources and programs that do exist. So in terms of programs locally in Calgary, again, where I'm presenting to you, presenting to you today, we do have the pediatric cancer survivors engaging in exercise for recovery or the peer program offered through kids cancer care. Peer is a volunteer physical activity based program for different age groups within the community, and it is offered to children and adolescents affected by cancer and their siblings. Results from a 2017 study assessing community-based exercise programs reported that PEER, the program itself, was safe, feasible, and sustainable programming. Additionally, there are existing resources, so resources that you can use, gain some information from, to help support movement in this population. Two good examples of this on my slide here are on the left-hand side, the Guide to Keeping Active During Cancer Treatment, which was prepared by a group of experts out of Australia, as well as on the right-hand side of the screen, the Pediatric Oncology Exercise Manual or POEM, which was prepared by a team of international experts and led by researchers in the health and wellness lab where I am completing my master's. And so these documents are a great starting place if you want to learn more about exercise, movement, physical activity, and how you can get started to help offer more foster more conversations with the individuals who access your services. So notwithstanding these initiatives, you may be wondering, what are we doing next? So what are Emma, Nicole, and Amanda, and our international team, what are we doing next with the IPOIC? And the answer is that we're working to ensure that those who use the IPOIC have access. So this means we are working to enhance reach and uptake. So REACH comes back to that map I showed at the beginning, understanding that we're making sure that as many individuals can access and use the IPOEG and uptake is taking the IPOEG and putting it into practice. And so to do this for my master's project, my master's thesis, I am creating resources with five different end user groups. So the groups you see in the pictures here, we have children and adolescents affected by cancer, families and caregivers, healthcare providers, community-based organizations, and qualified exercise professionals. And we are working together to co-create tools that each of these end user groups need to use the IPOIG. These might include things such as brochures, posters, videos, infographics, you name it. It's essentially what the end users identify that they need, and we will work with them to create those resources. So on this slide, you will see a brief overview of the process to do this. We first already started with a search of understanding what resources already exist, what exists in the context, in the field of pediatric exercise oncology, and also looking to other populations and chronic diseases as well. And we are working with end user groups to understand what resources they need and what resources they want. 
We're then going to work with a design specialist to draft mock-ups based on that initial feedback, have really iterative process to take our mock-ups, get feedback, update the mock-ups and go back and forth so that we can have input and modification. And so we'll likely go back several times, but the end product is going to represent the voice of the end users. They are going to be the ones working to implement, have these conversations and put these resources into use and into practice. And so we plan on sharing the resources with different end user groups. For my master's project, we are working with um, Alberta-based groups as well as Canadian-based groups, but thinking long-term, hopefully into my PhD program of research, making sure that IPOG resources can get out across the world. As you've seen, we do have a fantastic international network, which you may be joining, um, and we will be leveraging those groups to make sure that we get the uh, resources to them and working with them in different ways to make sure that we can adapt those resources to their own local contexts and languages. So we are mindful that um, those resources might look a little different uh, when, we, when we pass them on. And so beyond the work that I'm doing for my master's work, and the work with IPOEG, including resources to move it to practice. Doctors, Wurz, and Coolis Reed are working to create in hospital physical activity program. And we have ongoing research studies to do this. And so in these projects, we are including perspectives from international experts, local healthcare providers, and allied healthcare providers, as well as children, adolescents, and their caregivers. So we have a wide range of groups that are also involved in this work. Um, and we're working to achieve a few goals here. The first is to identify factors impacting implementation. So this could be things such as what will make it easier to implement a physical activity program or what will make it harder. It's important for us to know both of these so that we can create an action plan moving forward. We'll also be identifying important features for a physical activity program during treatment. It's important to gain this from the perspectives of all the individuals I just mentioned above on this slide. And we do know that this program might look differently, um, likely online and remote delivery due to COVID-19. We will also be using statements from the IPOID to help guide and facilitate this physical activity program. And we're also gonna be working to test the effectiveness and implementation of physical activity offered during treatment in Alberta. So effectiveness, is it meeting the goals of what we are trying to assess? Are we increasing physical activity behavior? And implementation is seeing how are we actually able to make this part of, um, part of treatment as well. And so as you can see, there is a lot of ongoing work to ensure that children and adolescents affected by cancer have opportunities to access physical activity. And you are all here today because you are taking incredible steps and already doing that. And so in wrapping up, I want to leave you with a few take home messages here that I hope to leave with you. And the first is that physical activity is safe and beneficial for children and adolescents affected by cancer. We saw this both on and off treatment. The second is that although efforts have been made to promote movement in this population, large gaps exist and we need to work to address these gaps. And third, the IPOID statements were drafted as a first attempt to help address these gaps. And the IPOID statements emphasize the importance of moving more, which we did a little bit of that break earlier. But that movement is anything that feels good for children and adolescents affected by cancer who you're working with. And finally, next steps include efforts to translate evidence to practice through resource development through my master's work, as well as the program development that Dr. Wurz and Coolest Reed are working on as well. And so with that, you might be asking yourself, what else can you do? You attended this presentation today, already keen and eager to learn a little bit more. You're also gonna be attending other incredible presentations, but what else can you do? Well, you can join our network. Again, a shameless little plug by scanning that QR code if you didn't get a chance to earlier. And by joining this network, you will receive updates on the resources that we're working to develop and disseminate, so you will get those. You'll also have the chance to provide input in the ongoing work that we are doing. And you'll also have the chance to connect with international experts, so that large team that we have growing, you can be part of that as well. 
And you also have the chance to connect with myself, Dr. Wurz, and Dr. Coolis Reed. Um, and if you want to learn more before you join the network, that's totally okay as well, um, but happy to have that conversation as we move forward. And so in conclusion, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the Health and Wellness Lab directed by Dr. Nicole Coolis Reed, where both Dr. Wurz and I are conducting our research. Additionally, I would like to extend gratitude to graduate student Kelsey Ellis and undergraduate student Amy Chen, who have both been involved in the ongoing projects, which I've described to you today. And a huge thank you to our funders who have made all of this work possible. As you can see by the logos that we have here on this screen, we have been very, very fortunate to continue this work. And I also wanna extend a thank you to all of you for your time today and your attention this afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are joining us today. Again, my name is Emma McLaughlin. I am presenting on behalf of Dr. Wurz and Dr. Coolis Reed. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have and connecting with you through our network. I know we have lots of time for questions and the floor is open. So I will stop sharing my screen here. And I will also pop my personal email into the chat here as well. Um, if you are interested and want to connect that way as well, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'll put two emails in the chat. The first one is my own. The second one is Wellness Lab. Wellness Lab is us. It's where all of our programs go through. Um, both Dr. Wurz and Coolest Reader are offline right now. So if you email them, you would be redirected to me anyways. Um, but I'll pop both those in there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Emma. Um, I have a question um, in terms of those guidelines being readily available to community based programs. What's the timeline on that? Because I know um, that would be a great resource for, for our camp program when we're, we're able to be back in person together. So I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Lauren. So currently our IPOIG statements, which I presented to you, those guideline and recommendation statements are under review through manuscript. So um, hopefully within, I don't know, timeline, I would say hopefully very soon um, before 2021. And so that's another goal. We know that at the end of the day, a manuscript is great in the world of academia. That's how we roll with things. But we know at the end of the day, that's not gonna help move those guidelines to practice. And so um, working to create those resources and sharing the guideline recommendation statements with you, with your teams, um, but also sharing those additional resources that we create as well, I think will be very beneficial. So don't have a definitive timeline, but hopefully um, within the next month or two, I would say hopefully. You get a little sneak peek today. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, my name is Shana. I'm from Camp Enchantment. I also run the pediatric oncology program in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the hospital. And I have a, a question for you about utilizing occupational therapy and physical therapists. So how heavily involved are they in creating all of these standards? And then what are, are there some recommendations to have oversight with uh, implementation with OT and PT involved? And thank you, Shana, for that great question. Um, so in terms of the IPOE, we do have individuals who were physio, who are physiotherapists and occupational therapists provide insight into the development of IPOE. In terms of the programs, or I guess the resources that I'm working with, I'm beginning to recruit healthcare providers from Alberta, which will include oncologists, nurses, physiotherapists, and occupational therapists. So they'll also be involved in the development of those. In the context of physical activity programming that I described for Dr. Wurz's work, um, we did gain perspectives and insight from physiotherapists, occupational therapists, because you know at the end of the day, a lot of them are already including physical activity as part of their rehab. And so we have gained um, perspectives and insights from them. Our next steps when we do work to understand and create this physical activity program is we'll be going back and chatting with these healthcare providers. Um, and gaining that insight from them as well. But we did have wonderful discussions on the desire for physiotherapists and occupational therapists to be involved. Is that something that they are already doing as well? Yeah, thank you.
anyone maybe started to think about, you don't need to answer to me, but maybe some of the ways that you're already including some of the movement into exercise in your programs that you may not have considered before. And so that movement can look like, can look and feel like anything. I know a simple activity that we do at camp, um, morning aerobics, uh, when we're in person before breakfast, throw on a silly song and, you know, maybe do some, some little punches in the air and, and get going. Yeah, the silly songs will get them going too, right? <laughs> I know Matt was playing some not so silly, but some fun jams as we came in. So, you know, that also got me going for this too. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Lauren. Any other questions? And if you don't have questions, I know sometimes you hear all this information, it can be information overload. And I did throw those emails into the chat and I am happy to discuss um, whether that's through email or setting up a time to chat afterwards as well on Zoom and can also loop in Dr. Kula's reading afterwards as well. Wonderful. Well, those are all the questions for today. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Emma for, for joining us. Um, it's a little round of applause, camp style. Um, so before you go, we are going to throw up a, a poll about the session. Uh, if you are on the CEU track, um, Matt has posted the link for that in the chat. Um, if you have trouble accessing it, let us know. Um, and then we hope to see you tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the medical roundtable number one. Matt and I will be back um, and you can jam with us before it gets started. Um, but thank you everyone for joining. Um, the poll should be going up. There it is right now. And uh, we will see you later this evening. You, if you are able to join us at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there is a meet away happening where you can meet some new uh, camp friends um, and uh, get to know some some people in the network. So we'll see you then. Thank you again, Emma. Really appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, great. Emma. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Enjoy the rest of this incredible conference.